Welcome back, we will continue our discussion on tactics. Today we will look at the quality attribute modifiability and see what kind of tax, tactics exist for that. So, what is modifiability? If you look at uh, the lifetime of a piece of code, typically the development time is very small in its lifetime. If you look at the costs actually, these are measured parameters. They say apparently only about 20 percent of the cost is occurs during the development phase. When we say development, what we mean is conceptualization, requirements, design, development, testing and once you deploy and then it goes into uh, the maintenance mode, it lives on for many years and it gets changed and so on. And so the first phase, the where you come to the first deployment is only about the 20 percent, is only about 20 percent of the total time and cost. The rest of the 80 percent goes in, in uh, the maintenance phase. So, we are looking at our ability to make changes during that rest of that 80 percent of the lifetime of the software. So, these changes are typically to uh, you know you may be fixing defects that have been figured out, encountered or dug out after the release, you may be adding new features or you may be actually sometimes retiring old features. You may want to incorporate new uh, technologies, new platforms. So, we are looking at the costs and the risks that are involved in trying to make these changes during the lifetime of a software. So, what are the tactics that are there for modifiability? They are classified into four groups. The first set of tactics says you know you reduce the size of a module that you, this is going to help in modifiability. You increase cohesion, you reduce coupling or you defer binding time, this is another very interesting tactic. So, in each one of them there are some set of tactics under this category for example, we will see these one by one. So, uh, if you are talking of modifiability and reduce size is the kind of tactic we are looking at, it is a very simple tactic. Typically if the module becomes very big, you break it into two similar smaller modules and if any change is needed, perhaps a change is needed only in one part of the module, so it is easier to change. The second tactic that we can think of is increase semantic coherence. So, essentially it says move some responsibilities from one module to another. So, you have two sets of modules, there are some, each one of them is performing some uh, function and then uh, if you see that uh, uh, there are some functions which are similar to the kind of functions that other module is performing, then you move it there. For example, all activities related to database read write should sit in one module, all activities related to network should sit in another module. So, that is a kind of semantic coherence we are talking about. Similar functions stay together. The other uh, next uh, tactic is encapsulate. Let us see if there is a module A using the services of a module B, what we should do is to make it available through an interface. So, there is an interface for B and uh, A access the interface class. So, even if B changes, if we continue to maintain the interface, A does not need to change. This makes modifiability much easier. So, this is the other tactic. Now, using an intermediary is another very powerful much used tactic. Essentially, what one is saying is there are these various modules talking to each other. If we use one module through which they all talk to each other, then it becomes easier to make changes. We encounter this in uh, publish subscribe uh, design pattern for example. There are a large set of publishers and subscribers and they do not even though one subscriber may be talking to multiple publishers and a publisher is serving multiple subscribers, they do not actually talk to each other directly, they talk through a intermediary. So, we can keep adding publishers and change their formats and whatever without having to hit the subscribers this is using an intermediary. So, the next tactic is restrict dependencies. This is again a very simple tactic, very often we see uh, our software in layers. So, if you make sure that um, the 
sharing of data and services is with the immediately next layer there is no drill down to layers below then other than the one which is next then you are actually helping in maintenance right let us see if we can draw it. So, let us say I have a I have a layer like this sitting on top of another layer and there is another layer here this one should not access this service it should only go through this. So, this is also help you in modifiability that is what we are calling maintainability. The next tactic we are talking of is refactor it says if the same service is being provided by two modules in two different situations refactor the code and make them one module. This is a situation we commonly encounter when code has been developed over time especially by two different sets of people there is some kind of function that is needed and somebody has written it some time back but uh, often without the knowledge and sometimes due to uh, other reasons we actually somebody else writes it again something very similar. So, when a refactoring exercise happens this aspect is identified and we try to put bring these two functions together and put it in one place and, and resolve any other small differences that may exist. So, this is also going to help you modifiability. Abstract common services is again very simple tactic if the services are not quite the same but similar implement a more generalized service. So, I have let us say this is dealing with integers this is dealing with strings and this is dealing with real numbers I may want to actually abstract them and implement a function which can resolve them through some polymorphic operation or something. So, defer binding time is actually a very uh, very nice tactic uh, all of us know about it in uh, more the ways than one here we are talking about the ability to make changes by people who are not software developers maybe at run time by end users very often. So, or system developers when they are booting up the system. So, this is these are some examples like uh, a very common example is uh, you can go and set the parameters the number of processes that your operating system will allow or amount of space that is allocated for a particular file or the size of the database buffers when a DBMS engine boots up or even simpler uh, the screen saver that you have on your desktop. These are all changes to the software made by the end user not by the programmer. So, essentially what is to be done what is to be computed what is to be shown displayed etcetera is that decision is postponed the binding time the binding time is deferred. So, configuration files are a, a very simple example of uh, understanding what deferred binding time is all about. You can also have runtime lookups you know uh, like changing the screen server is a runtime parameter. So, what we want you to do is uh, think over this modifiability issue and uh, look for some examples and uh, some new tactics. Thank you. Welcome back we will look at uh, tactics for performance performance is a fun topic right it is everybody is excited about it everybody understands it very easily and there is a huge premium uh, for performance ok. So, what is performance it is all about response to an event there is user types in a query we want uh, that is event and I want a response to that system should say something back. So, that is a response and uh, we are interested in how long it takes. So, that is the uh, performance of the system. Performance is also related to scalability in the sense uh, let us say the number of users goes up I have a website which can serve uh, a, a request quite fast for up to 10 users. What happens if there are a 100 users simultaneous will it still continue to give me sub, sub second responses. So, that is the scalability issue so performance and scalability are related. So, increasing capacity without sacrificing response is the scalability issue. So, if you look at tactics for performance we can classify them in two groups first one is 
control the resources that your computation demands. Essentially you reduce the resources that it requires to do the computation. The second one is you can do, you can manage the resources that you have in different ways to improve your performance. So let us look at some of these. Let us look at controlling the resources that are needed. The very elementary tactic is you have implemented a function and it is not good enough the response time there is an algorithm but there is somebody has suggested or come up with a better algorithm to do the same function. So from polynomial it may become linear or logarithmic and so on. So this is a very simple tactic right you basically use a better algorithm. So you are reducing the computational requirements that are needed for the function. So that is controlling the demand for the function. Another simple tactic that you can use is suppose there is a function that is being computed and right now it is taking two subsystems, two processes, two components. So some com computation happens here then it moves to the other one or some service is called for and so on. What you can do is you can actually put both of them together. If you do that you are obviously reducing overheads of moving the data there is a communication overhead is less. There are function calls which would happen in this. So typically if the function call stack is quite big and so on. So that is a simple tactic to reduce the demand that is there on the resource and that will improve your performance. This is an interesting tactic very often we encounter this. Let us say you are servicing some requests and a time comes when you cannot handle them anymore there are too many requests. If you try to service them then your response times for the other requests existing requests drop. So what you do is you just do not look at do not accept any more requests. So essentially what you have is you put in a, a system which is going to look at the requests that are coming in and let us say if the queue becomes larger than a certain number or if the response times for the existing services go beyond an acceptable uh, delay you just drop the request. We see this quite often in uh, internet uh, scenarios I am not able to connect to the server right that is because the server is refusing connections it can handle 30 simultaneous users and the 31st come I do not look at it. So this is the next tactic now here is another interesting one what it says is I am let us say uh, working on a speech algorithm I need to sample at uh, for fidelity is um, 16 kilohertz but if my processor does not allow it I can reduce the sampling rate to 12 kilohertz or 8 kilohertz or 4 kilohertz okay. So the hardware may be able to sample but the encoder does not pick up all the samples it picks up a fewer number of them okay. So that way I will have slightly degraded performance degraded quality but I will be able to meet the some requirement of having to continue to send my voice signal okay. So this is we call manage sampling rate right. So if you have a more powerful processor you can process it at a larger sampling rate if you do not have a very powerful processor you can everything works the same but you pick up only alternate sample for example you are just dropping some members in the in the data. This is different from this tactic here I am not entertaining requests at all in this scenario here canonical example there is one user there is a voice that is being processed maybe a cell phone the processor is smaller so I provide you lower fidelity voice lower quality voice okay is that clear let us move on bound execution time this is again a very interesting tactic so you are wanting to compute a, a parameter now let us say it is an iterative algorithm and uh, 
you can decide upon how many decimals you want to compute based on the resources you have right if you have a very powerful system you can go to six decimal decimal places or otherwise you stop at two we often see this in game playing programs suppose i am playing i have a chess playing program uh, the chess game is on my ipad then the the depth to which it looks up is called the ply maybe three moves or four but if i am using a supercomputer i may go deeper than that you know i may go up to six, six seven moves each increase of uh, each uh, one level uh, shoots the computation up by an exponential time right so i am how much time it takes for the system to suggest the next move is a function of how many resources i have i can control the uh, time to compute based on the resources i have okay by controlling the demand on the computation that's what we call control demand now let's look at how do i handle performance by managing the resources that i have the simplest is increase the resources that are available this is the first tactic you can use a faster processor or you can use more processors you can use uh, a higher bandwidth network or you can use additional memory uh, in the system and so on so all these will have the potential to reduce latency so the first tactic in the class of improving performance by managing resources is to basically increase the resources that are available for the operation this is again an obvious one uh, i can improve my performance if i can have concurrency right you can create a new thread or a process for one thread or one process for each activity and then that's going to help you improve the performance because this subsumes the existence of resources now this is a very simple powerful well known uh, heavily used tactic basically i keep multiple copies of data so how do i do that by caching right so instead of trying to fetch the answer from the server i can store it at multiple uh, levels at intermediate levels starting from my browser cache to the system cache to my proxy server cache to probably i have a content delivery network sitting in between like akamai and there are caches all over so that is we call that maintain multiple caches of data so this is another tactic to improve performance so what we are saying is you are hit with a performance bottleneck see if you can improve the performance by caching it or by one of these tactics so far that's what cache tactics are all about right i need to i want to i want to go and uh, attack one quality attribute and i want a design method to handle that that's what we call a tactic right so like you are maintaining multiple copies of data you can also maintain multiple copies of computation so that's what we call a load balancer so there is more than one place where you can basically do your computation okay so depending on uh, your requirement the load going up or down you can actually make use of both the copies of computation that are there so there are some issues in uh, in this we are we have to be careful about the state and such so on it may not be possible in all scenarios but sometimes it is possible very often it's possible we see this very heavily in the in uh, web architectures the this tactic is actually again very interesting it's about scheduling resources now what we are trying to say is let's say there are multiple demands on some piece of resource let's say the cpu and uh, one of the services is not coming up to mark in its latency what you could do is you can give it a higher priority basically what you are saying is you change the scheduling policy if you use a first in first out for example it is priority is same priority for everybody but you can say no any request from coming from this user or this ip address or will get higher priority so it's a changing in the scheduling policy 
that is another way to manipulate response times not applicable in all situations but definitely it is possible it has its space in some cases. So as I said performance is fun what you should think of is uh, how you have had tackled performance in your life in some some project that you have encountered or some system you have built surely you must have seen uh, I want to do better and done something. So try to classify that design tactic that design uh, principle that you have used into one of these tactics and see does it belong to have you used one tactic or two or a com combination of them or do you have a new tactic and if you do that will be fun we can talk about it thank you. We are back with now tactics for security the quality attribute security. So what is security security is about preventing unauthorized access but permitting authorized access. So this is an important distinction we must allow whoever is allowed to access to access. Uh, we also encounter attacks in the security scenario. So an attack is an attempt to access data or services so that is what we call an attempt uh, an attack and uh, sometimes there is an attempt to deny services to authorized users as well that is also a, an attack okay the ddos attack is, is this one so that's security now what we are interested in is how do i build a system where these issues are handled high security system so we look at the tactics for building secure systems they can be classified under four categories you have must be able to detect attacks so basically i want to build a system which can figure out that there is an attack happening there is an attack happening I must be able to resist the attack I will be able to react to the attack because if I recognize there is an attack I must inform people right or do something and if I indeed hit by the attack I must be able to recover from the attack. So these are the various tactics that exist for each one of them let us see some of these. So how do we resist attacks the simplest is make sure that the person who is trying to access the uh, data or the service is claims to be what he is you can have some digital signature or a biometric the most elementary one is the password of course and we end up using it's called a firewall here uh, you can call it something else if you want firewall has other connotations essentially a component which checks for the authenticate authenticity of the actor who is trying to access the data or resource so there is a request and then this one processes and then allows the request so once you have authenticated you authorize there are uh, several ways of authorization may I, if the user belongs to a particular class then he is access to certain kinds of services or there is, the user is a member of a list of people then the user is allowed to access certain uh, data okay and this is what we call authorization okay uh, the mechanisms for authorization so earlier we have authenticated and now we are authorizing to access this is a very simple tactic but nevertheless it should be covered now when i actually am transmitting data over the web i want to prevent eavesdropping i don't want people on the way to listen to what i have sent if i want to do that what do i do i need to encrypt my data so so there is an encryption component at either end so that component encrypts and decrypts so if and it is going this way you encrypt and send it when it is coming this way you encrypt here and send it essentially there is an ex, a new component in the system so that is to prevent eavesdropping this is a again a very simple tactic typically what happens is uh, the attacker has one way of compromising the system the system probably has one compromise which has been found out by the attacker there may be multiple vulnerabilities but user has come up with one if you can actually break your system into two systems even if this is compromised this will continue to function so essentially what we are saying is one way to increase your resistance to attacks is to have multiple to distribute your system on multiple 
processes, computers, systems and so on. So even if one of them goes down, you will the other parts will continue to perform and then you may be able to uh, you may be able to figure out that there has been a compromise and then recover quickly. So the next tactic is uh, a firewall if there is an unknown access unknown uh, user trying to come in you do not let the person to get in very often uh, many campuses run a large number of firewalls uh, I know in my institute uh, uh, we typically do not have any infection on, uh, on the windows machines because there is a firewall which is uh, tackling any kind of unauthorized access and attachments that are coming and so on. So this is a very powerful tactic and heavily used and works it works. So that is about resisting attacks now if there is an attack how do I detect it this is again a very important aspect of security uh, what you can do is you can keep a record of uh, earlier attacks and uh, see if any of the known attack pattern is being repeated. A simple uh, example of this is you know that this part particular IP address is, is a problematic one last time I got attacks from this IP address. So remember that and whenever that IP address again tries to access you can stop or do something about it right. So this is what this is a very simple case but it can get more sophisticated you can have a pattern you know multiple IP addresses or uh, suddenly a half a dozen requests coming from a location somebody is pumping in huge number of requests to compromise your system okay. So that is intrusion detection it can get more sophisticated of course. So <coughs> that is about detecting attacks. Now how do I recover from an attack so our simplest way to recover from an attack is to use an audit trail that is uh, whenever there is a change in your state some data has been written in or deleted or whatever you maintain a log if you have a log and then it so happens that this particular change is an unauthorized change then you can you have the ability to recover from it right. So this is an audit trail you can also figure out who has done this you, you keep track of not just the changes but also who made the changes right. So you may be able to establish the identity of the user and uh, you can actually recover from the system. So maintaining an audit trail is a simple way to recover from attack. So the homework for you now is we all know security has become very very important uh, it is probably uh, next only to performance. Now what you should do is uh, if you encounter, uh, encounter a security mechanism in your day to day life in accessing any uh, computer based functionality try to see how you can classify it to see what is the tactic that they are employing. Thank you. Welcome back we will talk about usability and testability tactics for these two quality attributes today it is going to be a very small module I am not going to go into detail so let us look at usability now what is usability the system should be easy to use right now having said that uh, one would tend to think it is probably all about uh, the user interface there is a very famous story uh, our uh, textbook writers uh, Bas Clemens and Kesman initially have uh, said that uh, usability is not an architectural quality attribute is not an architecture issue that means when you are working on usability it is not architecture which influences that is what they said in their first edition of the book but then very quickly they realized no there are architectural issues related to usability. So, uh, so we are talking about a system being easy to use easy to learn to use and so on so essentially the tactics for usability can be in two 
categories you are supporting the user initiative or you support the system initiative I will explain this in a minute. So how do you support the user initiative? The user wants to do something and you need to provide support from the system level and these are very powerful examples of supporting the user or helping the user. So the ability to cancel or undo an operation. Now actually this is also a good example to illustrate that this is an architectural issue. If I want to undo an operation I need to keep the state of the system previous to the operation. This is not a user interface issue this is a system level issue this is the this is an architecture level issue the architecture should support the system to be system state to be maintained right. You will agree that if I have a system which allows me to undo so repeated undos nested undos then it is much better to much easier to use than a system which does not allow right. So that is an example of how usability is a an architecture issue. So these are again uh, interesting uh, tactics what we are trying to say is the system could maintain a, a, a user model or a task model anticipate what is to going to come next and take some proactive action on that. If you want to do that that is a again an architecture issue it is not a user interface issue. So that is what we call a system initiative support system initiative. So these tactics which are classified under are classified under system initiative. So these are the tactics for usability I am not going to go in deeper into this we can read about this or discuss it as exercises. Let us look at testability testability is another very important quality attribute uh, I am developing a system I should be able to test it and uh, what we are saying is testability is an architectural issue that is why we are looking at uh, testability in this. So the ability to control and observe the state of a system is important for testing and reducing the complexity of course is also important for testing. So these are examples of tactics that you will use under testability specialized interfaces playback and record localize the changes to the state abstract sources sandboxing you make an executing assertions as make a assertion and execute that make a statement and see that the state happens. So these are tactics that are there for testability. So what I would uh, like you to do is uh, think about these not going deep into this because in my mind uh, for this short course uh, we do not need to go deeper into these tactics maybe sometime in the future if we meet each other again uh, we can discuss these uh, tactics and quality attributes in greater detail. Thank you.